Okay, great. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Cancer Patient Lab. We are excited, thrilled to have Savio Clemente uh, speak to us today. Savio is a stage three cancer survivor, um, and he's here to talk to us about his journey and how he's um, gone through the process, come out the other side, um, and what he's learned about his journey, both from a physical sense, but also from a mental sense. And um, the hope here is that everyone will be able to get some tools, some insights that can help them to navigate their journey. He said a few things yesterday in our um, in our little uh, introduction um, about how he has dealt with his cancer. And one of the things that struck me, which I think will resonate with a lot of the patients and, and, and anyone who's actually part of the cancer patient lab, whether it's uh, medical professionals or life sciences, um, industry experts, et cetera, is this notion of understanding what our mission is, um, that as a patient or anyone that is affiliated with uh, you know, this, this disease that we have. And so uh, he is a, a TEDx speaker, as I just mentioned. Um, you can see he's got his uh, full uh, <laughs> uh, podcast uh, microphone <laughs> set up and everything, uh, adding a professional element. Um, as always, I wanna remind everybody that this will be a recorded session. Uh, any information that we share today is not intended to be uh, medical advice, um, so you should always consult your doctor. Uh, if you don't want to have your uh, identity publicly available, you could exit if you want to, or you can, we hope you don't. Uh, you, you can also turn off your camera or, or remove your name from your, um, your LinkedIn, or not your LinkedIn, but from your Zoom profile. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to Savio. We, you're not going to do any slides. This is going to be a discussion. We hope that it's going to be very interactive. I'm sure that it will be. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, Savio. Welcome. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. Brad and Brian, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. I'm Savio P. Clemente. Um, Brian mentioned that I'm a TEDx speaker, but let me go back to how cancer has affected my life. I was diagnosed in 2014 with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, diffuse large B cell. Um, I it was fast and furious. I my stomach started becoming distended. I started getting extreme night sweats at night. I was actually away in uh, Paris and Amsterdam, and I was okay. I was like, okay, this is strange. So let's see. Came back um, at that time uh, in 2014. I really really sought out only holistic uh, alternatives for my medical care. And so my naturopath at that time said to me, something's wrong. And he told me to go seek mainstream medicine, which I did. Uh, I ended up seeing, uh, getting a sonogram. They would not let me leave the office for about an hour and a half. And they asked me to get a family member to come pick me up. I did, uh, they told me to go to the hospital. And literally within an hour, I was uh, I was uh, admitted to the fifth floor, and later that night, uh, I heard nurses talking about transferring me to what they call the seventh floor, which is the cancer floor. So I had an idea that night that I had cancer. I was bedridden for a week. I was in the hospital for a total of 15 days, and three days before I was released, I was told by the medical director that I needed to start my first round of chemo. Um, I'm all for medical intervention and medical therapies. I wasn't against it. I just... I didn't have time to process it all because it was just thrust upon me. And she made it very clear that if I did not start my first round, there might not be, um, I might not, uh, you know, live to tell. That's what she basically said to me. So I started it. I did a successive uh, six rounds every three weeks of our CHOP therapy. In addition to that, I did a whole bunch of integrated modalities because I just believed for myself that the best course of action for my healing would be a combination of both. And um, later, within about four and a half months after receiving our CHOP and integrative therapies, I was given my remission status. This past December, it's been nine years since I hit uh, my nine-year remission. Uh, with that, I knew after five years, I wanted to, um, I was called to have a mission of doing something in this field. And so I ended up getting my board certification in health and wellness coaching. Um, at the time I was writing, and so I'm a media journalist. And so I pitched an idea to my editor. Uh, for a series called I Survived Cancer, here's how I did it. At this point, I've interviewed 200 cancer survivors, all different walks of life, different types of cancers, 
And one of the most pressing questions I asked them in that piece was, if cancer had a message for you, what would that message be? And a lot of them were, what are you talking about? Cancer is the big bad wolf. I want to get rid of it. But I really, truly believe in some level that cancer is here in our lives to, to show us some bit of wisdom. Uh, it doesn't have to be a pleasant wisdom. It could be a painful wisdom. But there's a wisdom in that. Uh, since then, um, I also uh, ended up choosing 35 individuals from that interview series, told my own story and launched a book about a year and a half ago, it became a bestseller in several categories, which to me means that the story of hope survives, which is really the main reason why I even did the book. Uh, and then since then, I also gave my TEDx talk on the topic of seven minutes to wellness, how to love your inner stranger. And I used that stranger very um vaguely because I wanted people to resonate with this idea of stranger. For me, the stranger was shame. I felt a lot of shame with my cancer. I felt like I was disappointing not only myself, but other people. And I also felt that cancer is a very physical thing. And for me, I, I knew that I was, um, I was very hopeful and I knew that my emotions were alive and I knew that I wanted to cultivate more connection with other people and create more things in the world. Um, so I basically, the stranger for me was that aspect of myself that I needed to pull out from the physical part of me that was dying in the hospital. Uh, and so um, I made it a mission to do that. And so today I'm really here to really talk about a main crux of my TEDx talk, which is this idea from the CDC or the survey from the NHANES survey that said that 20 to 46% of cancer survivors experience some level of anxiety or depression at least once a month. Um, and so for me, I really wanted to spearhead this idea that we can go deeper within ourselves and cultivate a more meaningful relationship with not only the people around us, but dealing with this aspect of what cancer does to our lives and how we can shake it up a bit to find meaning in it. So hopefully that, that was a lot, but uh, that's, that's in a nutshell. Talk about. Great. Th thank you, Savia. Um, so uh, for those of you uh, who may be new, um, please use the raise your hand feature in uh, the Zoom um, to ask questions. We really want to make this an interactive conversation. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and kind of get us started. So Savia, as we talked about uh, yesterday, there are, you know, the Cancer Patient Lab um, really services prostate cancer, uh, brain cancer and, and pancreatic cancer. Um, and obviously with prostate cancer, which is what I have, um, it afflicts men, of course. Um, and, you know, we hear a lot that, that men internalize uh, their cancer differently than women. And I'm just curious, as you've gone through the, you know, uh, interviewing 200 cancer patients, diverse cancer patients, you know, well, what have you learned um, about how men and women um, handle this this disease? And are there best practices for uh, you know for our patients that they can they can you know take away from this conversation? Yeah. So I would say about seventy percent of my interviews were mostly females. They were ready and wanting and willing to talk about their journey and what cancer has done to upend their lives and what cancer has shown them over the course of their treatment. Um, it was very hard for me to um, get males to talk about it because it's a very, uh, it really goes against the grain of what they think that their life is or their power in the world and how they want to express it. And even more compelling was the fact that I couldn't find males of color to speak about their mm -hmm. cancer journey. So you would think that they would be featured in a large publication, that their story would be out there, but they felt to a large degree that their story was something that they wanted to keep hidden still, uh, which I respect, uh, but that was actually very, very difficult for them. So uh, in my coaching clients that I that I coach, I really coach them on this aspect of this horrible thing happened to you. Now, what do you want to do with your life? How do you want to uh, create amplification and tell your story and have that be spread as a vehicle and a mechanism for hope. So I would say, really, I go back to my trainings, this idea of like positive psychology, this idea of not only bouncing back and having resilience, but seeing the vision of how you want to feel. It's not a goal, but it's a vision of how you want to feel. And where do you want to see your life 
going from there? Because as you mentioned, most of your audience are stage four or some of them are. And it's this idea of, well, I have no more hope, but there's always some level of understanding and some level of um, overcoming and some level of um, wisdom, I think you can glean from that. And so it's really this idea of flourishing, uh, seeking, seeing yourself as growing despite of the treatments that you're, you know, that you're going through, seeking social support with your friends and family. I would also say this idea of self-efficacy and self-regulation theory, this idea of managing that anxiety using tools like breath work or meditation, or even journaling is a really great uh, tool because it's a very private thing that we all go through. And so journaling really helps a lot of my clients process that, that whole ups and downs. Um, also, I would also say this idea of what is wellness and what is illness? Is it, is wellness, is, is illness the absence of wellness? Like what is all this? And so a lot of people really get confused because they say, well, I'm in remission or I'm out of treatment, but I don't feel well. I, I don't, I don't see life the way I used to see it. And so mm -hmm. I think it's also coming to terms with the new normal. Yeah. You know, I think also, um, uh, uh, uh it is sort of this cloud cancer is this cloud that it's just you know, that weighs on top of um of everybody um how do patients sort of like resume some sort of level of normalcy in their lives uh so that they're not com completely consumed by this disease it's a very hard thing to do quite honestly because as patients we're constantly reminded that we have the disease simply by the fact that we're going through treatment, you know, you got to wake up, you have to take, you know, a, a medication, you know, uh, or you've got to go to the hospital because you've got to have surgery or you've got to have labs. There are all of these reminders, right? Um, you know, how to, how to, and, you know, honestly, for, for, for people that are, you know, family members, friends, after years, that, that can be really um, tiresome. Um, uh, to be around somebody who's constantly, you know, burdened by this disease, right? <laughs> talking about cancer every day is not a fun thing to do. Yeah. I'd rather, you know, talk about sports or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, how do you like who, who? How do people navigate like the normalcy from the from the you know managing the disease? I often. Um say to people and clients and patients and uh, who know someone who's going through cancer or is going through cancer themselves is a lot of your power is given to something that's beyond your control. Literally, you are going through therapy, you're going through chemo, you're going to radiation, whatever those treatment modalities are, they're all physical. They're all things that you can't control. Your doctors are informed. I love my doctors, but they don't really know the end result, right? They're just hoping as well. And so I think the onus is to take your power back to some degree. How can you do that? Well, you can do that by regulating how you see the world, how you control your emotions. What do you see your relationships being? Your conversations with your friends and family doesn't always have to revolve around your cancer. That's what a lot of the interviews that I did, they were like, a lot of people were like talking to me about my cancer and I don't want to talk about, I want to talk about Taylor Swift or I want to talk about something silly because I don't really need that from you right now. And a large portion of the interviews I also did, they mentioned this idea of a lot of their friends and family said, what can I do for you? What can I do? What can I do for you? And they're like, well, you know what? Why don't you come with me to the doctor's office? So that way I don't have to take in all this information. You could be my scribe. You could do something worthwhile for me mm -hmm. rather than having to say, you'll be fine. You'll be okay. Everything will be fine. And that's great, but it doesn't really doesn't really mean a lot because you're battling and wrestling through your own demons. Uh, so I think that's that's really the key. And I found, and what I do best is, no one can take away your story. Your story is your own and how you want to tell it, how you want people to feel from it, that is up to you. And so I really remind people and I really uh, uh, encourage people to, your story doesn't have to be this lofty book or this lofty podcast. It could be something as simple as just, having that deep conversation with your loved one or a family member or a friend and just saying, listen, I don't feel well. I don't feel well at all. I don't know how this is going to end up, but I do know one thing. I do appreciate the fact that you did X, Y, and Z for me, or I would rather you do this 
and have those difficult conversations because I actually lost an uncle last Monday. He had uh, pancreatic cancer, but really stage one, he had complications with heart disease as well. And his daughter kept saying over and over again, my dad didn't say anything. My dad didn't say anything. My dad didn't say anything. Literally, not only about his disease that he was battling, but other things in his life. And so I just found it very poignant because for me, that's the work that I do. I do the work on the back end to help people not only survive, but help people see themselves as greater than just living, but really seeing themselves as thriving. And I know that's hard with this audience that I'm talking to because it is looks like hope is is very dire at this point. Mm -hmm. But you know, this idea of legacy is also another part of story. Mm -hmm. How do you want to tell that legacy of yours? So they're all mixed into one, but uh, hopefully that lands for people. Yeah. So there's um there, there are a couple of hands that are raised, but I'm just gonna um tap into a couple of things that you said there. Um, so this this notion of legacy. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that and what have you learned about how patients think about their legacy? Um, yeah, just curious to get the perspectives that you learned. Sure. So one of the individuals in my book had stage, um, sorry, had stage four pancreatic cancer. He was given a 2% chance to live. He was, he was a finance guy, numbers guy. And he's like, why can't I be part of the 2%? Uh, why do I have to be 98% of the ones who don't survive this? Um, yeah. And so for him, it was really not only telling his story, but allowing people to see him as more than his disease, allowing people to see him as someone who did the best that he could in this world and contributed and br brought as much good as he could possibly give. But I think legacy is also this idea that future generations would would sort of um, learn from your experiences or learn from your mistakes or learn from your growth or learn from your successes. And I think this idea of legacy is often um, only thought about when it's at the end of our cycles of, of life rather than what we are creating in the world. So a good friend once mentioned to me that he does a 50, like at the end of the year, instead of creating um, uh, you know, a wish list of what he wants to create in, in the next year, he writes down what he created, even the small wins, what he created in the year that just went by. Because for him, he could then say, that um, I did something to move the needle a little bit in my life. Yeah. Okay. Super helpful. I have another question, but I'm gonna um, I'll, I'll let some others chime in here. So Paul has his uh, hand raised. Oh hi. Yes. Thank you, Savio. Um, that last comment reminds me that I've instead of doing a to do list, which I've always you know my list of what I want to accomplish, my, the monuments to my life moving forward. And as my capacities diminish over the years, even though I'm handling my stage four prostate cancer really rather well, um, there's a trimming process that um, is very valuable to identify what you don't want to spend your time and attention on anymore, what is not serving you. So we call that the to stop list. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that that also is of service. Uh, but my question re it relates more to relationships. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was diagnosed almost 18 years ago now mm -hmm. uh, with advanced prostate cancer, and it was terrifying to me. And I found that I kept it private for a while, but finally broke out of that and told people oh, I have this cancer and especially when I had biochemical recurrence and I knew I was not going to be cured, that this was going to be with me and it was going to be part of my story for the rest of my life. And I did identify it as my teacher, say, okay, this phase, I've got, I've got this other thing, which gives me an immediacy and a sense of focus and, and identifying what's important and what's bullshit. And uh, in, in a really clear way. But as I, if I may say, came out to my friends that I have cancer, that certain ones that I was thought I was very close to could not handle the information. They could not identify me as a person with cancer, does not compute. And they just immediately pulled away from the relationship and, and withdrew from very long standing. Uh, friendships, which was 
uh, hurtful. Um, it, it, it was a loss and it was a surprise. And I, I, I couldn't have identified who those would be and who others would be that would come forward and, you know, and say, hey, how are you doing? And whenever anyone does that, it, it, it opens my heart. And I say, oh, thank you for asking. And actually, I'm doing really good or not so good or challenging. Uh, but to be able to have the conversation and identify pe the people that you can't have that with. Um, but there's a loss in the ones that just don't have the ability. And maybe they're not mature enough emotionally to, to create a space for someone to have a, a, a life-threatening disease. So I'd like you to address that. And then also... The fact that in our prostate cancer forums, not just this one, but in very, very large forums, I think over 50% of, of the prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer patients, the one participating in the forum is not the patient, but it's a, with the wife or the daughter or the grandchild or the mother, um, but a female that's close to and cares about them. They're the ones that go on the forum and participate and try to find a way forward and how to deal with things. So that's very, very interesting. Thank you for your comments. Sure. So a few things, well, thank you for sharing, Paul. So a few things come to mind. It's this idea of acceptance. And that's a hard pill to swallow because, you know, I tell people often all the time that my cancer is an invisible cancer. It's a blood cancer. You, I don't have scars. I didn't I didn't even have a port. I told you my veins were so good. Now they're shot um, that I didn't have a port. But I often not only have em empathy for individuals who have lost literally physical things that they can't say that they don't have anymore. They literally don't have it. So you can't pretend. It's this idea of accepting what really is, staying present in that. And so uh, it's it's sad to see that those relationships of yours, Paul, has withered away, but that's a common story in the people that I've interviewed where people just can't handle that. They can't confront it in themselves, and so they see you as a reflection of that. So I think the only thing to do at that moment is, is an exercise that I like to do is really about you saying to yourself, okay, this has happened to me. Who in the world do I admire? And try to embody those qualities that you admire. It could be a friend, it could be someone from history, and pull and draw to you those people who support that idealized version of yourself. Because like I mentioned before, we can't control the physical aspects of what's happening. We have to go through the motions of treatment. But there's other aspects of self, which is the emotions, which is the, the mental aspects of ourselves, our relationships, even our spirituality. Uh, if you believe in some level of soul, what the sole purpose of, of us having this and having gone through this or going through this is so I would just just ask you to cultivate for yourself who do you want to draw in to then bolster your ability to thrive or to just get through the day. So hopefully that helps you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh Eric. Sorry, I couldn't unmute there for a second. <laughs> um so first off, that I, I love today's topic. <laughs> uh, so thank you for bringing this. You, every like key phrase or word you have said has been is something I've been working on. Acceptance, uh, present, you know, living in the present, journaling, meditation, therapy, Thriver. I was going to try and show you. I don't know if you can see. I got a homemade <laughs> bracelet that says Thriver right there because that's what I, I did. Um, in my opinion, this has been harder for me than the physical part. Um, and the physical part is significant. And and so, like, a lot of times people ask me, like, how you do? And, you know, they, they tend to see cancer as a physical disease, like you said, right? And I'm like, you know, the the mental emotional part is is a hundred times more challenging. Um, and so because of that, I have put a lot of effort into my emotional and mental health. And I I'm not negative about my cancer now. I I kind of see my cancer as a trigger for me to get healthy in every other way. 
Um, and, and I'm hoping that that leads to healthy in a cancer way also, right? Um, and it's, it's weird because I totally feel the part about friends not talking to you. My, my own brother, I hardly talk to him now. He, he's literally never once asked me, how am I doing with my cancer? And I kind of have to walk away from that because I, I can't worry about it every damn day, right? Um, that's that's the acceptance part. And so I don't I don't know that I have a question, but I just wanted to reinforce that all of this is I think that this is like the the biggest benefit for for me doing this and it's helped my mind, it's helped my journey and right now my results are really good and and I ha I'm hopeful that um I might get to go off ADT here later this summer and, and give that a try. Um, and so as I kind of inch towards that, I'm having all these thoughts of like, okay, who is the new Eric? I already know a bunch of that, but then there's a whole bunch more questions I have around that. I mean, certainly I have new friends, you know, I eat a different diet. I do, I, I live my, I think differently about stuff, but there's parts of it out there. I'm like, I don't want to go back to all the old stuff I used to be doing. I don't want all that stress and busyness and lifestyle. And so now I kind of have like this anxiety around who am I going to be? <laughs> and and I'm working through that. And whether that's, you know, cured of cancer or I have a recurrence, like, like Paul just said, cancer is always going to be part of my story, no matter what. It doesn't always have to be the leading uh, peace, but it's always going to be there. It has changed me in virtually every aspect of my life. Um, and I'm not shy to tell anyone uh, about it. In fact, I have a, I mean, I have a private Facebook group and caring bridge site for, you know, to start it out as status updates, but honestly, I have, I have dumped some deep stuff out there to people. And I get a lot of people that comment back of saying, this is just so inspiring to actually see your experience of going through this. It's not just, oh, yeah, I see that scar. Or, oh, I see that weight you gained or something like that, right? So I actually get a ton of benefit out of processing and putting it out there and then even more inspiration to hear back that other people are are getting value from that. So um, I don't know. Thank you. I want to I want to check out your book now. I, I haven't heard of it before today. So thank you. Eric, thank you for sharing. I, I know that wasn't easy, so I appreciate it. Um, it really brings to point of really the main reason why I did a TEDx talk. It really wasn't for the part of, it wasn't really for the fact of doing it. It was really, I wanted to tell a story. I want to tell a cancer journey story. And I want to tell a story that allows people to have some type of call to action. And so what I use was a framework called Aloha. We all know that in Hawaiian, it means hello. So it's a hello to your inner self. And really the acronym is really simple. It's acknowledgement, listening, opening, harnessing, and acting. So this idea of acknowledging where you are, listening to that inner voice, opening yourself up to self-compassion and self-forgiveness, which I is huge in my clients that I serve. It's huge in the people that I interviewed, this idea of letting go and releasing, because what you can't pour in, you have to release out. You cannot pour more than what is available to you or what capacity you have. Uh, H is harnessing, so harness those ideas within yourself. And then A is acting, act with that purpose. And So I just love the fact that you circled back to that premise that I really wanted people to take away with, that these things happen to us. We might not know the cause of the effect or why they do, but we are living, and at some point, we have to find a way through the maze. And I, like you, I would never say that my cancer was a blessing, but it did open a path to do this work that I would never have ever seen myself doing or speaking to. Uh, I knew only a couple of people who had cancer before I had my own diagnosis. Since then, I've lost many, many people to it. And since then, I've, I know a lot of people who survived it as well. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I like that. Maybe. Maybe, maybe Eric, if I can just uh, chime in here. Um, the first time you and I chatted, I remember vividly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we, this was about like 
mm-hmm. month two or three of my journey or something like that. I'm I'm about 20 months in right now. So oh, okay, okay, yeah, I didn't. I, I lose track of time. I'm horrible with that. Uh, as uh, David can attest, I think we can all attest. Uh, but I remember distinctly, I had just gone to the dry cleaner and I was <laughs> talking to you in my car <laughs> and. One of the impressions that I had was uh, our dear friend Bryce Olson um, got us together. Um, and um, uh, I just remember that you were, um, uh, it, it seemed to me that you were just kind of almost scared, like you you didn't know what to do, um, but you were very intentional. You, I could tell like right away, like you you were going to try to figure out a way to yeah to figure this out and to to attack it um but there was there was this sense of just a fear is really what what yeah. what uh what came came through <clears throat> and I, i'm just kind of curious you know so that was the starting point and just hearing you speak now um is not the same person uh you know uh you you sort of like evolved um, very much. Yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a good point. So as I just mentioned, uh, it was month two or three when, when I first connected with you, right? Uh, maybe even one or two. I don't know. It was, it was early. Mm-hmm. Um, no doubt. I was scared out of my mind at that moment. You know, I was diagnosed with stage four uh, with one met and um i lost my dad to pancreatic cancer a couple years prior that was his second cancer journey and the way it started for me is when i went to the year i mean i had a high psa test it was 146 it was and i didn't even know what that meant to be quite honest and then they sent me to urologist and uh they did the dre test and then he doesn't even say the word cancer to me but he says we can buy you some time. And that's the exact same words they told my dad in February of 2020. And he passed two months later in in April. And so those first couple months, that was the mindset that I was in. Like I was honestly, I was just so scared. Like that this is, this is the end. Right. Um, But to your point about, (laughs) we're going to attack this, right? It, and you know, it's not just me. It's my wife, Stephanie. She, she's been on some of these calls and she is a research hound <laughs> and she has done so much digging. Um, <laughs> so my motto since like the first week was control what I can control. Um, And that really meant like lifestyle and supplements. I I went vegan. I went, you know, plant-based. I ramped up my exercise. I started therapy week one um, because I had a previous relationship with therapy. And it's grown to where I've, I don't know, you you mentioned other integrative modalities. Um, I've probably done over 50 other things, uh, you know, outside of the Western medicine treatments. And I think that all of that has been good from cancer perspective to get me here, but it's also been good from just an overall health perspective. Um, So I will tell you what the turning point for me was, Brian. And this is shortly after I talked to you. I I think it's in kind of like the month four or something of my journey. I read the book Radical Remission by an author named Kelly Turner. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that book. There, there's some similarities here with your book in, in that she uh, was a PhD student and um, what she did was go out and interview people who had had a radical remission, me- meaning they they had a case that was so far gone that doctors didn't give them any chance or so advanced, I should say, um, people that maybe wanted to forego any kind of conventional medicine, et cetera, et cetera. She, her questions just like, what did you do to, to get here? And she came back with hundreds and hundreds of items. And really what it boiled down to in the book is that there's nine common items that every one of those people had done. Only two of them are physical. 
take care of your diet and uh, have supplements to to help balance your body. Other things are um, have a strong sense for living. It's uh, develop a deeper spiritual connection. It's release suppressed emotions, and I don't. There's a couple more I don't remember off the top of my head, but that was the book that I said, okay, I can do this. It kind of gave me a game plan to say I can work on all these other things, right? And do starting to read that gave me a sense. Uh, it started kind of with gratitude and positivity. Um, and once you start doing that for a little while, you you start to forget about the negative things because you you just start seeing the positive side. And and that may sound weird to people who haven't done it, but it's when you start to think one way, it be, kind of becomes commonplace in your life. And, and it's not just cancer. It kind of is, is everything in my life, you know? Um, and it evolved into me being very vulnerable and, and sharing what I'm going through. I'm not scared to talk about any piece of my journey. I mean, um, with people and, um, a big one for me has been acceptance. I heard that term thrown out here, and that that came after a little while of working through these things. But you know, if I go back to my motto of control what you can control, that is crucial. But the flip side of that is you have to have acceptance of the things that you cannot control. And working on that has given me you know, the ability to kind of accept that those, I can't control those and those outcomes are there. And you know what, I'm, I'm okay with them. If I think, if I think about them, uh, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I can accept death for myself. I have a harder time accepting that for my family. Um, but for myself, Yes, I can tell myself, you know, I lived a great life and I got to do all these good things. And yes, it could end earlier than I wanted, but I can accept that. And so this is why I said earlier about working on all this mental and emotional stuff has really changed the game for me. I am at peace most days. I'm not having a ton of anxiety and depression. I don't say none. It, it comes up from time to time. Um and I've learned much better how to deal with that, um, you know, because I do a lot of meditation and journaling and still see a professional therapist and and other stuff. And so I am very different, Brian. It's interesting to hear you pick up on that. <laughs> I mean, we mm -hmm. don't interact a ton. Um, mm -hmm. And for the most part, I like it. I like yeah. who I am right now. You know, yeah. and so that's why I'm like cancer has been a, a a good thing for me in that regard, in that it's triggered me to change everything. I'll say one last thing about positivity. You, you know, you just said uh, we would never call cancer a blessing, right, Savio? That's what you just said. Um, I don't know that I call it a blessing, but I also do not use negative language towards mm. it. I do not say that I'm a fighter or a warrior in a battle. I say that that I'm in a healing I'm on a healing journey. Um and I don't complain that I got cancer. I did in the early days. And that just goes back to my mindset of trying to be positive. And, and in a way in my head, if I say that I'm in this battle, it it just conjures up all this negative energy in, in my body. And and I don't want that. So, so I don't know, maybe got a little rambling there, Brian, to your question, but um, I'm trying to just kind of cover the journey a little bit. So, yeah, no, I didn't think you rambled at all. I do think that, you know, the, the, the notion of blessing um, is an interesting one. Um, I do tell people that it's a blessing for me. Um, mm. And now maybe that's an overstatement, um, but at least, you know, the notion that, that um you can look at the situation and see the good in it rather than seeing you know it's half empty versus half full you know <laughs> it, that's so so true uh and you know maybe it's just uh uh yeah it, it it's either you can you can address it or you can you can just suffer by it 
you know, uh, and I, I kind of, I, you know, I think I, I choose to, to look at, you know, how to, uh, how to use it as a tool yeah, to absolutely. improve my life um, and to address things maybe that I haven't addressed uh, in the past. Um, th there's a, a question that came in sort of um, anonymously that I'm going to try to paraphrase and, um, and see if I could get some insight from you, uh, Savio. We talked a little bit about it um, just now, Eric, I think talked about it, but you know, we have some patients that are young, you know, primal life uh, that are, uh, you know, highly accomplished people, you know, um, very active physically, um, you know, really at the top of their game. And their cancer has impacted their ability to uh, pursue um, things that they that they could in the past. And it's it just emotionally can be incredibly draining because there's there's this this challenge of always comparing who you are today versus who you were a year ago. Oh, a year ago I could run marathons and you know could compete and all sorts of different things. And today I'm just physically incapable of doing that. And the question is, you know, how, how does somebody accept that new reality and enjoy the future instead of constantly putting oneself through this comparison, um, you know, process? So what comes to mind are, I love movie quotes, by the way. So our mm. two movie quotes, uh, obviously, uh, one of them is the Shawshank Redemption, which is get busy living or get busy dying. And then yeah. another one that really comes to mind is this idea of in the Titanic, where it's we were waiting to live or waiting to die. Mm -hmm. And I would say to answer that question, it's it's a, it's a difficult question because no one wants your time cut short. No one wants to not fulfill their wants and needs. But I would say, and it harkens back to what we just discussed a few minutes ago about control the controllables, control what you can control, do what you can to move the needle forward in any which way that you can. But also I would, I would also say maybe as an idea is to write a list of things that let's say worst case scenario doesn't go well for you, that someone can, can take the baton forward for you, that someone can actually advocate on your behalf or do some of the things on your list that you would like to have accomplished, not because they're doing it for you, but really they're doing it as a way to have your memory and your spirit live on. Um, and I know now we're, we're getting into the realm of like, what ifs, but mm -hmm. this is reality for us cancer uh, individuals yeah. who are facing something as awful and terrible as cancer itself. And um, I would say as well, um, maybe the third option is really to go back to this idea of vision. I keep mentioning it because it's very important. It's not a goal. The vision is how you want to feel. How mm -hmm. do you want to be? How do you want others to be to feel and be around you? How do you want your energy to come across to other people? How do you want your energy to be infused in the world? Mm -hmm. And so I, I I would probably say those three things is uh yeah. is a good starting point. You know, I'll, I'll just say one thing. And uh, Amit has his hand raised, so I'll come to him in just a second. But um you know, the, the notion of legacy is really, really important because um, it, it sort of takes the focus away from you. Um, and it's really about um, what is it that you want to leave behind? So it's more outward um, facing um, than inward facing. Of course, to be outward facing, you have to be inward facing. You got to kind of like figure out like what it is that you want to do. Um, but it's the focus. The focus changes to what is it that you want to leave behind? What is it that, you know, you know, yeah. so anyway, so, I, and I think that that process of, of um, thinking beyond yourself is a way to, to look beyond the, the trials and tribulations that you may have like on a daily basis. So yeah. I, I love and, that, I, the idea of legacy. And, and it's also one of the tenets of most belief systems, this idea of service. You're not thinking about self. You're thinking about how you want to be of service to other people, even though you're going through a painful time, even though things look bleak even though it might not turn out the way you want it to turn out. So yeah. I definitely concur. With that. Yeah. I'm going to try to share a story here in just a second. Uh, and this is a very uh, ad lib, but I'm going to pull up uh, or, uh, Amit if you want to speak. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is 
obviously a very interesting conversation and you know a lot of us have uh, gone through our own kind of thinking and uh, um you know how we want to deal with it um i i mean i'm generally a very positive person have acceptance of kind of the reality um yeah. but i struggle with the fact of saying that you know cancer is a blessing for me and and i i, I wonder if it's a it's a state it, it's determined by kind of the, the outcome or where you are in the spectrum of outcome i mean i have been dealing with my disease uh, for 5 years and you know nine courses of treatments a lot of integrative stuff a lot of kind of you know um spiritual mental other support a very I mean, excellent family and friends support network um but it has been downhill my my health continues to go down nothing has been able to put a you know put a pause to kind of the declining health um clearly uh cancer has changed me me uh, you know i was at the prime of my life you know both professionally and uh, uh at a personal level and just you know it was just kind of an uh you know uphill uh, uh kind of a kind of a good good way of you know just kids in college let's you know start to enjoy life and you know professionally on a good growth path um so i've i've changed and learned a lot as a person so i i, I again the, clearly something like this changes and uh, changes you as a person and uh, you know i'm not frustrated i don't you know pass you know or or complain about the fact that i have cancer but i still struggle to call it a blessing because a blessing would be you know when you are able to do things that you enjoy and that keeps changing obviously me again i enjoy to you know I, i enjoyed a lot of things and i can't do a lot you know most of the things now that i enjoy uh, enjoy to do so so i wonder if it is it is just a matter of you know people who have it in control can consider it a blessing and people who uh, are just not finding control struggle with that doesn't matter how positive you want to be so uh, i don't know in your experience uh, savio with the, you know talking to patients if you if you find that type of a correlation of you know who considers it a blessing versus who's like yeah you know i'm i'm all good but it's still not a blessing for me i appreciate the honesty amit um thank you thank you for sharing I think it really boils down to your view of the world or your belief system. Um, a lot of people that I talk to really find pain in the purpose of cancer and found that they themselves found some relational aspects of how cancer has showed up in their life and what they need to do to respond to it. But I agree, it's not a universal thing, seeing it as a blessing or seeing it even as a curse. People are just uh, a little bit detached from it. But I would probably challenge you a little bit to... Um, be going back to that first question that I mentioned, which is, if cancer had a message for you, Amit, what would that be for you? Maybe think about that a little deeply and say to yourself, like write down a list, like blue sky, of some of the things that you think cancer had a message for you. And what would that be? I think that would inform your acceptance of it, but also your day-to-day -day dealings with it. Because it creates this ability to have that exchange, which harkens back to my TEDx talk about the stranger. Like I mentioned, I meant I did it intentionally vague on purpose because a stranger could be anybody, someone that's dangerous or someone that's you don't even know that could be really a great friend in the future. So I might leave it as that because I know you're, you know, emotional. I know this is an emotional topic for you as well. But um yeah. I probably want to leave it there. Yeah. Thank you, Savi. Yeah, I mean, um, again, I wasn't, um, you know, you know, just 
being in the tech industry and kind of with my background and everything else, um, you know, is not a vulnerable person, an open um, person, but all of that changed to me. It took me a couple of years of the journey to uh, go through the metamorphosis of uh, and and change and I actually write a public blog a blog about it. I mean, it's not a uh, it's, uh, it's on Medium, and I write a blog about my learnings and my you know uh, takeaways and things that I have learned and how it has changed. So I've been very you know sh um, been open about it, and uh, you know like um, uh, like Eric was saying, I got get you know, huge feedback from my audience on just kind of how I'm sharing things and how I'm, you know, uh, learning things. So, so again, they're, 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 you know, great aspects of things that have come out of it in, in changing me as a person. Um, my acceptance was there from day one. I mean, I've never kind of questioned it. It's, it is what it is. And I'm going to do everything now to to battle it and fight it. I read the book Radical Remission, just like Eric said, also um, a while back. And uh, But again, I, I in, in my very last blog, I actually, I talked about this, that, you know, do I consider it a blessing? Uh, no. I mean, blessing would be when I, I, I've changed, but at least I'm able to do things in life that I enjoy to do as opposed to being you know just totally uh disabled by it right so uh, yeah. like maybe like anyways having a child is like uh maybe more of a blessing than um than than having cancer maybe that's that's <laughs> that's, that's the opposite <laughs> yeah. way to think about it um Eric. Anyways, i'll let it yeah. go so, thank yeah you. i just wanted to add a couple things to the previous questions. I'll try to be quick since I talked a lot earlier. So so first off, um, Amit, you, you know, blessing. I, I do think that it's got to be easier um, when your cancer results are going well or better, right, or under control. And, and that is me to, to this point. Um, I think it's easier. I have thought forward that, you know, there's probably a day in my future where there's going to be uh, negative results and that will be harder. That will test me for sure in, in this mindset. And I also now have this, this attitude of, okay, no matter what, I'm still going to try and thrive through that day and the, the best I can. Um, so I just wanted to say, I, I think your question is, is true. I, th I think it's easier when, when things are, are good and you're enjoying stuff, right? Brian, I was gonna add your question was about how do people start to, uh... <laughs> my ADT brain, I don't even remember your question exactly. Um, oh, how, was how, something... how, how to separate yourself from your, your, your past self, yeah. like your, your, your strong self. You know, so I just wanted to add the first piece of my journey where I started doing that was gratitude mm. and starting to, starting to do a daily exercise of just kind of listing like what things am I grateful for in my life today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm grateful I'm alive. I'm grateful I have my family. I'm grateful you know, I have a job still, these kind of like basic things. And eventually that becomes kind of commonplace and you start to have gratitude in other areas also. And um, that also then led to living in the present. So living in the present means you're, you're not having the anxiety ab about what's going to happen tomorrow. And you're not also having the regret of what happened yesterday. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying that's an easy path by any means. Um, just trying to throw out a couple highlights. I started with gratitude and that's kind of where I, how I got there. So, yeah, no, that's a great word. It's a, it's a good key takeaway. Um, just begin a mindful of time here, David. Yeah. My, uh, cancer diagnosis, I guess I was fortunate that they were very clear 
up front. Uh, there was never any uh, question or ambiguity as to what was going on. But my very strong sense at the beginning was one of betrayal. Mm. You know, you know, I didn't do anything to you. Why are you hurting me? Why are you trying to kill me? Um, and that took a lot of time to get over. Um, it got easier once the uh, uh, the pain management started to work. It got uh, uh, harder when I was uh, nauseated. Um, it got uh, harder when I came up against those things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do. But um, uh, getting past that initial anger at, at the betrayal, uh, that was difficult. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are many patients that, that feel that way. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Um, so, Savio, we are coming up here to the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of time, but maybe if I can bookend this just a, a little bit, because something happened uh, that might be able to kind of connect a few dots here. So um, I referenced uh, Eric and I meeting each other through a mutual friend, Bryce Olson. Um, Bryce Olson was a prostate cancer patient uh, who... Uh, lived for nine years with the disease, uh, advanced. Uh, he was de novo uh, metastatic. Um, we became uh, very close, and um, he was he was uh, he was the ultimate patient advocate. Um, he was very very. He used to work for Intel and and used all of Intel's health sciences resources to support him on his journeys. He, he was one of the first to really get into sort of like using precision medicine um, to, to help him through, um, through his disease. Um, and just a couple of days ago, I had lunch with uh, the VP of sales for Boston Gene. Boston Gene as a partner of the Cancer Patient Lab. And um, we got talking and um, I'm like, oh, you must know Bryce Olson because she worked at Tempest. And I've done a lot of things with Tempest as well. So she worked at Tempest before she worked uh, at Boston Jean. And um, anyway, we ended up having like a three hour lunch and it was a, a really good meeting. Um, and I, I sent her a note and I, I thanked her for everything. And, and she bounced back just last night. And I'm just going to read a couple sentences of what she what she uh, what she relayed to me. And it this is about legacy. And so this is. Uh, as we think about our legacy, um, this is an example of how it lives on. So she says, uh, I remember very vividly meeting Bryce and wanting to hang out with him because he was so smart and his energy was contagious. He confirmed that I must do more for patients with cancer. After meeting him, he left such an impression that I had the ability to retrieve the memory of him and what he spoke about at times when I felt overwhelmed with trivial things. It was a way for me to zoom out and not lose sight of the end of, uh, at the, at lose sight of the end of goal in my life and career. So, she, you know, they haven't really talked in, in you know, in, in a, a couple of years. And he left such an impression upon her that in times when she needed to kind of bootstrap and get through uh, whatever she needed to do, you know, she remembered why she was in this industry, trying to save patient lives. And so that is the legacy that he left. And that's only one person. And I know he's largely the reason why Cancer Patient Lab exists. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you because I do think that the, the notion of legacy is just so, so powerful. Um, so thank you. Any closing words? Yeah, so I would, a few things come to mind is um, really how I end my TEDx talk, which is this idea of to know thyself is to heal thyself. It's really this idea of it's always an inside job that we can allow our doctors to do their part, which is the physical and that stuff we really can't control, but we need to do the work and the work involves us figuring out for ourselves legacy, our, our impact in the world, what do we want to still create what are our emotions? What's bubbling to the surface? What's the conversations we don't have that we should be having with our loved ones or with friends and family? And even detailing what our fears and 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 uh, hopes are really, because it's not it's not the end until it's the end, uh, so to speak. So I would say that's really 
important. And then also as a journalist, I've had the fortune of interviewing really some amazing people like Venus Williams, for example. And people look at her as the epitome of physicality. And she's like, no, I'm going through my own journey with my digestive systems. People think of me as one way. So it's really this idea of being kind to yourself and not comparing yourself to other people's journeys throughout this process. And really, David, you know, to your point, it's really about figuring out for yourself, you know, we, we use this idea in coaching, which is if I could have like a magic wand and wave something. If I took away your cancer, David, if I took it completely away, what are the things you would be doing with your life that you're not doing right now? The purpose of that is not to have a fantasy about it, but the purpose of that is for you to find some small ways that you can still create positivity in your life. So that's what I want to leave everyone with. Great. Well, thank you. Um, this was a, a, a very complimentary session to what we normally do, where we're usually talking about science and whatnot. And, no, I, uh, I, I've seen them. <laughs> <laughs> science and math and models and whatever. Uh, so this is, you know, this is such an important element um, of the of the cancer journey. And uh, we're just honored to have you uh, share your insights with us. And uh, maybe we can even invite you back for another session some other time. I, I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. All right. Appreciate Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.